Daniel Mag Danielle McGuire has earned her PhD degree at Rutgers University and is presently an assistant professor of history at Wayne State University, Detroit, Michigan. In writing her dissertation, which became this book, she has taken a huge step to reveal a true history of African-American women with well-researched documentation that proves and proves again the horrors of the United States and especially the Southern past. It seems clear that we are not finished with the fight for equality, civility, and humanity yet. But with revelatory works from truth tellers like Dr. McGuire, we are on our way to freedom land. Southern Regional Council, the Lillian Smith Book Award Committee, and I are proud to present one of this year's Lillian Smith Book Award winners. I am sure Lillian Smith, whose plea was how shall I be heard, is applauding somewhere for Professor Danielle L. McGuire as Smith's voice resounds through time because of these new advocates for justice. Please, Dr. McGuire. And this is the award, and uh, I, so I don't look like I'm uh, uh, an Indian giver, as it were, excuse the phrase, uh, but um, Danielle cannot hold on to this while she is presenting her paper, so I'm going to take it back. But <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, we're Thank happy you. to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming this afternoon. It's wonderful to be back in Decatur and back in Georgia. Um, it's an incredible honor to win this award since the Southern Regional Council and Lillian Smith had such an enormous impact on, my, on me as a citizen and on my evolution as an historian. In fact, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that without both of them, I'm not sure I would have written this book. And I think that's kind of a funny thing to say to, uh, to someone like me, a white northerner, who was born decades after the Civil Rights Movement. So let me explain. I was studying African American history at the University of Wisconsin Madison in 1998 when I heard this wonderful radio program on NPR. I was transfixed by these stories of the civil rights movement that the Southern Regional Council had gathered for their show, Will the Circle Be Unbroken? Anyway, that day's episode was about the 1955 Montgomery bus boycott, but it was different than anything I had ever heard before. Like most people educated in our public school system, I believe that Rosa Parks started the boycott partly because she had tired feet. But Joe Asbell, the city editor of the Montgomery Advertiser, talked about Gertrude Perkins. He said this, Gertrude Perkins is never mentioned in the history books, but she had as much to do with the bus boycott as anyone on earth. And if you're thinking what I was thinking in 1998, you're probably wondering, who the heck is Gertrude Perkins? Well, this question took me about 12 years to really answer. And the result, of course, was my book. The short answer, though, is that in 1949, two white Montgomery police officers kidnapped Perkins, drove her outside of town, and assaulted her. Somehow she found the courage to report the crime to the police, perhaps even the same men who had raped her. As a result of her bold testimony, though, African Americans in Montgomery rallied to her defense. NAACP activists, labor leaders, and ministers formed an umbrella organization called the Citizens Committee for Gertrude Perkins, and they demanded an investigation and a trial. Their public protests lasted for over two months. As a result, they exposed the long-standing practice of white police officers sexually assaulting black women, they forced a grand jury hearing, and they brought the city's disparate black ministers together for really the very first time. So what does this have to do with the 1955 bus boycott? I mean, this is in 1949, six years before the boycott begins. What I found was that the 1955 bus boycott is often portrayed as the opening scene in the civil rights drama, but in many ways, it's really one of the last acts of the Montgomery movement. 
In fact, the bus boycott was the logical outgrowth of a decade of black women's activism and a history of gendered political appeals to protect black women like Gertrude Perkins from sexualized violence and rape. What happened to Gertrude Perkins was hardly unusual in the segregated South. In fact, from slavery through the better part of the 20th century, white men in the segregated South abducted and assaulted black women with alarming regularity and stunning uniformity. They lured black women and girls away from home with promises of work or better wages. They attacked them on the job. They abducted them at gunpoint while they're walking home from church or school or work. And of course, they sexually humiliated and assaulted them on buses and in streetcars and in other public spaces. And that was the pattern throughout the South during the 1940s and the 1950s. And it really underscored the limits of Southern justice. Lillian Smith wrote about this pattern, though she never explicitly spoke about rape in her courageous book, Killers of the Dream. In it, she talks about the menace of white men's, quote, backyard temptations. And she argued that while there are no available statistics on the frequency or range of biracial sex activities in the South, this everyone knows, she said. Whenever, wherever, race relations are discussed in the United States, sex moves arm in arm with the concept of segregation. In this book, Killers of the Dream, Smith explored the consequences of what she called the race-sex-sin spiral and how interracial sex, both coerced and consensual, sat at the center of white supremacy. Through that book, I think, is, or I'm sorry, though that book, I think, is more of an exploration about the psychology of segregation and white supremacy, reading it when I was in college made me see white supremacy in a different way and made me use sex as a lens through which I could view segregation. And I was particularly interested in the subject of white men's backyard temptations, and that was, of course, black women. What I learned was that African American women had a lot to say about this history, and they didn't always keep their story secret. In fact, from the slave narratives of Harriet Jacobs, to Ida B. Wells, to Fannie Lou Hamer's stark testimony, about a forced hysterectomy, hysterectomy and sexualized beating in 1963, black women reclaimed their humanity by organizing public protests and testifying about their brutal assaults. And their testimonies often led to larger campaigns for civil and human rights. So even the most oft-told and illustrious civil rights struggles, like the Montgomery bus boycott, the Selma campaign, the 1964 Freedom Summer, they often have roots in organized resistance to sexualized racial violence and a gendered political appeals for the protection of black womanhood. And so essentially, my book, At the Dark End of the Street, argues that rape and resistance to rape sits at the center of the modern civil rights movement. And I think that movement looks really different when you include black women's testimony and their resistance to these kinds of attacks. For example, Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks is often characterized as this meek and mild woman whose tired feet made her tiptoe into history. But her story is more revealing and so much more interesting if you include the issue of sexual violence. For example, in 1944 in Abbeville, Alabama, an African-American woman named Reese Taylor was walking home from a church revival. A gang of white men kidnapped her off the street. They drove her to the woods and they brutally gang raped her. When they were finished, they dropped her off in the middle of town and they told her if she told anybody what happened, they would kill her. Well, she told her husband, her father, and the local sheriff the details of the assault. And a few days later, the Montgomery NAACP called to tell her that they were sending their very best investigator. It was Rosa Parks. It was 11 years before the bus boycott. Rosa Parks arrived on Taylor's front porch with a pen and a notepad and took notes on what happened to her. And then she took Taylor's story back to Montgomery, where she and the city's most militant activists organized the Committee for Equal Justice for Mrs. Reese Taylor. They launched a movement that the Chicago Defender called the strongest campaign for equal justice to be seen in a decade. It's not surprising to me that I found Lillian Smith's signature 
on the postcards and petitions in the archive in Montgomery. Parks was able to help organize this nationwide campaign in 1944, in part because she was already a seasoned political activist, even in 1944. But it was arguably her own harrowing account in 1931 that made Parks an anti-rape activist decades before the women's movement made uh, sexual violence a public political issue. In fact, recently discovered among Parks' belongings at Guernsey's auction house in New York, where her personal archive awaits a buyer, was an essay that she wrote in the mid-1950s. In it, she details the long history of white-on-black sexual violence and reveals that her great-grandmother, a slave, was actually the victim of multiple rapes. She also testifies about being sexually propositioned and threatened by a white man when she was 18 years old and working as a domestic. But she doesn't just talk about her vulnerability and her fear, something she makes explicit. She also fiercely asserts her right to bodily integrity. No matter what happened, she wrote, I would never yield to this white man's bestiality. I was ready to die, but give my consent? Never, never, never. I'm not sure how that Rosa Parks, the Rosa Parks who says never, 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 became the silent and sainted icon of segregation that is endlessly taught in schools. But it's awfully revealing. We have accepted too long this notion that women were always silent about sexual violence and that white attacks on black women's bodily integrity were somehow separate from the civil rights movement. But they were not. The right to move freely through the world without being assaulted is a basic human right. And it was something that African Americans fought for during the long freedom struggle. My hope is that at the dark end of the street recognize and honors these women whose bold action and willingness to speak out about sexual violence when it was dangerous, if not deadly to do so, sparked movements that ultimately helped to change the world. And I hope that their stories serve as an example to oppress people everywhere, to use their voices as weapons of protest against injustice. I'm confident it's a message that both Lillian Smith and I hope the Southern Regional Council would continue to support. Thank you so much, and thank you again to the University of Georgia, the Southern Regional Council, and of course, the Georgia Center for the Book. Thanks.